Kawangware, Kabaragara, Tunis, Bamako, Gaborone, Banjul, Addis Ababa, Antananarivo, Asmara, Africa, my motherland. How do you feel? Where does it hurt? Where is the music? Bissau, Brazzaville, Cairo, Freetown. Show me your feathers. Raise your flags. Welcome to Afro Masculinity Podcast. I am your host, Onyango Otieno, from Nairobi, Kenya. Here today to talk sex and the African man. With two new words to teach you. One, Osunality, African eroticism and sensuality. A term coined by Nkiru Nzegu, a Nigerian philosopher, painter, author, curator, and art historian. Two, phallocentric, which means focused on or concerned with the penis as a symbol of male dominance or having male sexual feelings or activity as the main subject. Pretty sums up how we talk about sex in this continent, huh? On the music, lined up today, hits and beats from Gambia's Sona Jobarte to DRC's Kolinga. Kenya's Why Ray the Love Child and Mali's songbird born in Cote d'Ivoire, Fatumata Diawara. Welcome. Welcome. I, I relish really your, your presence. presence. I can't talk to my dad about sex. <laughs> that sounds like a suicide mission. The nearest reproductive health conversation my mom and I had was she was telling me she could arrange for my circumcision at a church hospital and she still gave me the liberty to choose whether it's something I wanted. Sex at home wasn't something people talked about. In fact, I remember when we had any sexual scenes like people kissing in a soap opera or a movie, all of a sudden there was just so much tension in the house. People would be pretending to be doing other things and not looking at the screen. That was just a hard thing to talk about. I mean, that's for privileged people like me who grew up around all with TV sets. But for so many other African boys, that wasn't a reality. So who teaches these boys about sex? In the olden days, before our systems were disrupted, we had mechanisms to teach boys about these things. Age groups and age sets where older men would converge adolescent boys and talk to them about family, about protecting their communities, about sex but when slavery came and colonialism came starting way back in the 7th century with the the arab slave trade so many men who were doing these duties were taken away from us and so this huge vacuum was left for african women who had to deal with the loss of their husbands being taken away the loss of losing land the loss of losing their freedom, also the fact that they were raped and abused in many other forms by colonialists and sometimes also taken away as slaves. So the African family was hugely affected by these systems of of violence to the point where now it was more a matter of survival than actually teaching children what to become. People just wanted to get to the next day. People just wanted their children to to be alive. People just wanted some kind of continuity to happen for their clans. The, The social structures were broken down and it was such a systemic order that we barely noticed it. My first sex experience was rape at 20 years old, which completely changed my life. She she was a newly brought house manager, had only stayed with us for about three weeks. This incident happened early 2009. 
now i was doing my a level education in uganda and uh you know the kenyan system has guys who like close maybe end of for the december holidays like end of end of november and and open really early january but for the ugandan system we closed just on the last week of november and opened on the last week of january back in kenya when people were opening school high schoolers of uganda were still at home so for for those of us who were in kenya we were still at home so we were we were i was left with this girl she was about five years older than me and at this time i hadn't noticed that i had been violated i think i woke up 10 years later that's when it came to me because i was i think i was having a conversation with somebody and then it just clicked like whoa wait a minute something happened to me back there and i hadn't noticed that i was violated i was like whoa i was i was probably raped you know and the, the thing with rape as i also had had thought it was it has to be something so violent somebody has to hold you down and stuff like that but that's not always the case very few people know that so this thing happened twice i was shit scared because the manner in which it happened so fast the way she used words to lure me into something i didn't understand didn't ask whether i was okay with it um, she stripped me naked. She she tried to make me do things. <sighs> and, I mean, I knew sex existed. I mean, 20 years old, a bit exposed. The farthest I'd gone was just to masturbate. But I didn't know how our vagina felt. Because I freaked out and I was scared. I didn't come inside her and she called me a coward. I didn't know how that was going to affect me until a few months later when i went back to school now something like a week after the second incident she started puking and i could notice some patterns like something was off about her and she knew that i noticed and i was so sure that if this girl was pregnant that i wasn't responsible because you know so she decided to open up to me because i mean we were two people in that whole house for nearly a whole month so <laughs> you had to talk so um and she noticed that i was freaking out it's just that she was a stranger to me and now i was even more scared of her because i didn't know whether it was somebody whether she was she was gonna hurt me in any way and the way my brain reacted to danger at that time because I was already highly traumatized by a lot of childhood trauma. Anytime it looked like somebody was going to harm me, my brain froze and I just followed orders because my brain was protecting me from any further harm. So I just wanted to protect myself. To get out of trouble, I just do what you want. She finally told me her story and she told me she's pregnant and she was sure that wasn't mine and she went on to say she had slept with the son of the owner of the house she worked at before she came to ours man and went on to tell me about her life story about how she was a former sex worker in kibra uh, kibra is a uh, the biggest slum in kenya you know she was an orphan trying to make things work in her life and stuff like that and all that was just so hard to take in at once, you know, and I was even more scared. I go back to school. In the system we were in, every time we opened school, we we did cuts that first week. It was horrible, man. <laughs> it was the most horrible thing. So, of course, I mean, you're from holiday. Who's been studying at home? You had all two months to just chill and, and, and do stuff with your friends. Nobody was reading at home. I mean, very few people did. So, anytime people opened, we were just going straight to the books to start revising, start revising, start revising. I get a text this night prep from mom, and she's just asking me how I'm doing, how school, and stuff like that. And then she goes on to ask, um, did so-and-so tell you that she's pregnant? And I say, yes, she did. And then mom asks, might you be involved? 
<laughs> a question I totally didn't expect. And of course, in typical man lingo, I say, I deny. No, 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 I wasn't, I wasn't involved. And at that point, I'm confused because I don't know the conversation they are having on that side. And I'm also sure this this cannot be like it's not my like we had this conversation i'm i'm not responsible for for her pregnancy i was so sure <laughs> um then my mom throws in the next question did she tell you she had an sti whoa whoa that took me out and i freaked out and i started shaking and my deskmate jane from wanda asked me yo what's up was are you okay and yeah i tr- i tried to pretend through it so i i managed to do the cuts by this thing this thing kept revolving in my mind i didn't tell anybody so i remember going to the library and usually the only thing i would do when i went to the library was read magazines and poetry. In fact, that's where I met my Angelo's work. <sighs> but this time now I was going to the biology books which I hated so much. <laughs> and I, I was looking through that was the Google of the time. The way, you know, when you, you have symptoms and you're just checking through Google what what are the possible <laughs> diseases that you're harboring in your body? <laughs> And I'm looking through all these STIs, oh, gonorrhea, syphilis, blah, blah, blah. The worst to the worst, man. And the feeling was the same thing you feel when you check through Google and you're not like a certified doctor. You don't know what's going on. Oh, man, poor me. (laughs) I started itching in my groins. And these fears started proliferating. And I started imagining, man, um, am I going to die? It was just this once. It wasn't even done in a proper way. There was just too much around it. Is this it? Is this it? Am, Am I gone? And this itch starts growing and growing and growing and growing to the point where now I can't even walk properly and it's too much. So I finally gathered the courage to talk to my desk man. It's like, yo, Jane, man, I had sex last holidays and uh, I didn't even tell her I had been violated because it didn't register to me that time. It's not even something I enjoyed. And then she was like, yo, just, it's okay. Just go to the dispensary. I got the courage to go to the dispensary. The context is, this was a staunchly SDA school. They didn't even want guys to date. And we were like 12, 1300 kids in that place from Eastern Africa. There was a lot going on. And being a church school, sex was again not a conversation to have with anybody. If you're not supposed to be seen holding, if you're a guy, like you're not supposed to be seen holding a a girl's hands. I mean, who are you going to talk to about sex? So I get to the dispensary and I find the doctor who by coincidence had my like he he was a namesake of my english name which is eric i wait for everybody else to go until i was left with him alone i get into his room and i tell him yeah doctor i i had sex last holidays and it was unprotected and uh, i'm itching and it's it's been two weeks and i'm going nuts He looks at me and he said, okay, let me look at it. (laughs) Which was the funniest thing because he's like, he's like the first guy who touched my thing. You know, those things don't happen, man. So he did some tests, did some tests, did some tests. And then he told me to, 
you know, he was going to send for me the next day for results, which you could imagine were the longest 24 hours of my life. <laughs> next day around 3 p.m., I'm barely concentrating in class and uh, he sends somebody to come pick me. It was a long walk to that dispensary. I get in, I find he's put a Fanta soda on the table for me. My mind is telling me, yeah, this is it. This is it, bro. And he starts talking to me and this was probably the only person who's ever given me any kind of comprehensive sex education. Told me the need to protect myself, especially when I'm having sex with strangers or people whose sexual history I don't know. He tells me the need to always have have condoms, man, strap up, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your partner, stuff like that. And those things couldn't register much that time. But um, he also told me that I got lucky. I had only contracted a fungi and it wasn't something so serious. And I guess the question my mom was asking me is, are you safe? <laughs> you know, but she just couldn't put it that way because I think they discussed that I had sex with that girl. I think they discussed it. That's why she was asking me if I was involved with her pregnancy. Now, the doctor says, you have to buy this medicine on your own. The school won't pay for this. And I was okay with being broke for the whole time as long as I was going to be healthy. So I gave out the money and uh, the medicine is sent for. And I was okay. In about two weeks, I was fine. But something else happened to me. So many things changed. Something cracked. Something I'm about to share after this song. Jeté dans les eaux Un peu malgré moi L'appel est si fort Que je me perds un peu parfois Qui on est, où l'on va Au moins je sais Qu'un bout de mon âme demeure chez toi Congo à l'image de ton fleuve Ton tumulte m'émeut Et arrache tous mes masques À nu je me jette à l'eau quel enfant suis-je pour toi, le sage ou le têtu Celui qui t'aime, en tout cas te l'ai, je dis le sais-tu Congo, avec toi j'aimerais me lever Congo, avec toi j'aimerais danser Congo, avec toi j'aimerais avancer vers des jours plus Passé, le futur, un sentier de bohémien Bout de toi, bout de ton âme, je suis Ta sueur et tes larmes, j'ai su En fond du fleuve, des forêts, des villes Des cupides ont dévoré nos vies J'ai lu chaque ligne de la lettre à Pauline Du fond de l'abîme, j'ai vu l'aurore aux palines Avance, je trébuche mais j'avance Vers des jours plus heureux Je danse des rombards raturés Aux guitares saturées Mégaphone à tout tête pour chanter Avec toi j'aimerais me lever
Between dancing grooves and bewitching trances, the Afro-folk duo Kolinga takes us on a musical spiral that is both tender and powerful. Black music finds its African origins while taking the path of modernity. Congo by Kolinga off their Earthquake album. Part of this song translates Congo with you I would like to get up. Congo with you I would like to dance. Congo with you I would like to move towards better days. Congo with you I would like to get up. Congo with you I will love peace. You have revealed to me the treasures of my soul, the secret which is no longer one. Your heart beats at the same rate as mine. We are not separated. Congolese honor our sacred kingdom. Oh the stuff of tears after being relieved of the pain of contracting the fungi from my rape ordeal something changed within me that i couldn't get a finger to but after this period I started having a lot of reckless sex which to me was confusing because I wasn't sure am I exploring or is this an addiction so what would happen every time people closed school I didn't travel home with everyone and when they opened I didn't come to school with everyone there was a guest house in Kampala near the old taxi stage it was called Samadien guest house like a lot of us who used to flock there a lot of kenyans i don't know if it still exists ugandans will tell me i would spend nights buying sex sometimes even with two or three women on different schedules in one night that's how you know things were out of hand even though it looked like something I was enjoying deep down I knew something was off and yet there was nobody to talk to about this stuff it was also the first time I was really away from home for a long 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 time away from the noise away from the violence away from dad asking me where I was what I was doing who I was with and so I also thought I had the liberty and freedom to roam about and do whatever I wanted. I had money. I had the time, I had the energy. I was 20 in a new city and Kampala, Kampala can swallow you whole if you don't know who you are. I came back to Kenya in 2009. It was time to focus on my campus education. I wanted to be a journalist. I'd always dreamed of going to Daystar University. So in between the waiting, I had a lot of free time on me. I wrote a lot of poems. I read the dictionary a lot. And I also joined an app called To Go. <laughs> Near death Twitter, where are you? Anybody who was on To Go, you guys are ancestors by now, man. <laughs> So for those who don't know, to go was this social app that had these chat rooms from different places where you could join in with a username and chat with anybody who was just just have random conversations with people. So if you were in Kenya, you had chat rooms from different towns, right? And sometimes you had access to chat rooms from other countries, I think South Africa or something. I can't remember that well. There was also a lot of sex chatting. <laughs> in this application i met a lot of people with whom i had very 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 random sex i traveled for <laughs> kilometers on end just for it i think it got to a point where sex lost meaning to me i probably woke up when i got to 25 well because i fell in love my life was kind of started to take a very different trajectory. Now, I couldn't tell what trauma was. I couldn't tell how it had affected me. I just knew something wasn't right within me. This was on top of all those things I'd gone through as a child. And now, sexual trauma. 
you can imagine how thick that was. And it was difficult for me even to trust people, to feel close to people, to have healthy relationships. I thought everything just needed to be about sex. Every single conversation I had with a lady stranger, I wanted to flirt with them. I wanted to, I wanted to be sexual with them. And there are studies actually that have been made to show how the brain of a child is affected. A child who has been sexually molested. For some, they take that act that violated them as a safety net. So they always go there to try to feel safe. And that's what happens to me and, and so many young people like me. Men get raped too. I opened up about this ordeal on my Twitter, November last year, 2019. The feedback wasn't really shocking. It's something I'd expected. More women were supportive because they could relate, and many men were sincerely sorry that I'd gone through it. But so many others could not conceptualize a man being sexually violated like that. It made me learn how many of us only view rape from a very narrow lens, but there are many types of rape. Date rape, gang rape, spousal or marital rape, rape of children, statutory rape, prison rape, <laughs> really rampant, serial rape, payback rape, war rape, rape by deception, corrective rape, custodial rape, ceremonial rape, status rape, a whole range of variables. In 2017, a story came out from Libya, male rape being used systematically as an instrument of war and political domination by rival factions. Years of work produced harrowing reports from victims and video footage showing men being sodomized by various objects, including rockets and broom handles. In several instances, witnesses say a victim was thrown into a room with other prisoners who were ordered to rape him or be killed. Female rape is significantly underreported, but male rape almost never. During an attack on his village near Kagabandoro in Central African Republic, Emmanuel, not his real name, was captured by an armed group. They took him to a temporary military base in the bush, along with seven other men and boys. For about a month, Emmanuel endured repeated sexual assault and other forms of physical violence. This happened in 2017. They stripped me and tortured me until I had no more strength, he recounts. His abusers, members of the Central African Patriotic Movement, MPC, struck him with their weapons, raped him, and hit his genitals. Some soldiers amused themselves with my penis, he says. They amused themselves with my body. Emmanuel was forced to perform oral sex on the troops and have anal sex with the other prisoners. He tried to resist but was beaten and left unconscious, nearly dead. They said they were doing this to dominate us and make us fear them. In DRC, if I talked about it, I would have been separated from the people. Even those who treated me would not have shaken my hands. Stephen Kigoma was raped during the conflict in his home country, the DRC. He described his ordeal in an interview with the BBC's Alice Muthengi, calling for more survivors to come forward. I heard that I was a male rape survivor. I couldn't open up. It's a taboo, he said. As a man, I can't cry. People will tell you that you're a coward. You're weak. You're stupid. The rape took place when men attacked Stephen's home in Beni, a city in northeastern DR Congo. They killed my father, three men raped me, and they said, You are a man. How are you going to say you were raped? It's a weapon they use to make you silent. There are men dying in silence across this continent because of the brutal shame their bodies have been ravaged through, and further, the shame associated with opening up about it. Why are we so afraid of talking about sex?
This song was written by Sona Jobarte to mark the golden jubilee of independence for the Gambia in 2015. The song features the seruba, an instrument no longer featured much in Gambian mainstream society. By featuring the drum in this song, Sona not only aims to resonate with the deep history of the Mandinka people, but also to boost and promote awareness of this instrument both in the Gambia and internationally. Sona Jobarte with Gambia. Even when I started enjoying sex, I think I still didn't know my body. We focus so much on how women look, their sizes, their voices, their faces. We rarely talk about the politics of a man's body. And perhaps this is because a man's body is meant to be used for capitalistic gains. It's like a tool for productivity and indeed men's bodies are also sexualized i mean just look around you my relationship with my body nobody in my life has ever told me anything about how to pleasure myself how to listen to my body how to pay attention to what i'm feeling i had to figure these things out on my own I started masturbating when I was 15 years old. At the time, I didn't even know it had a name. But it wasn't really me looking for pleasure. It was merely a coping mechanism for the depression that I was just about to get into. You see, this was my first year of high school, taken so far away from home in a school I didn't particularly like. The prefects were abusive to us the teachers were abusive to us everything just smelled like war and i was so familiar to war because home felt like that and i really 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 wanted the world to stop so i started touching myself my christianity didn't allow me to talk about that either <laughs> but how is masculinity connected to sexuality Every day we see how men measure their sexual prowess by the size of their dicks, the depth of their voice, their looks, their body count, their social status. And these are things we, we, we aspire to become because from a very young age, we are actually taught to look up to other men. We are not taught to look up to women. We are taught to look up to other men. To be like them. Cool, successful, wealthy, wealthy men. So that we can be likable to both men and women. And that's how patriarchy works. It teaches the boy to work so hard to be likable by men and women. At the end of the day, the man is still at the center. But in a man's sexuality, he's not taught to look at himself. His inner self. He's not taught to examine who he is. He's not taught to listen to his body. There's a lot of sex education for women. In Uganda, we have the Sengas. In Zambia, we have these pre-wedding events that involve quote-unquote bed dancing, where they use drums and dancing to impart sexual knowledge. To the background of a drum beat and singing, women perform dance moves that stimulate sex. Once the bride-to-be has got the moves down, she can use them to arouse her husband. In Kenya coastal region, bachelorette parties have someone called an auntie who gives advice on marriage, usually an aunt or older female relative. What do we have for men? Is it always assumed that a man knows how to please his wife? And even the concept of virginity, where did it really come from, do we know? Why do we give it so much precedence? Why don't we pay attention to our bodies as men? I had one sexual experience with somebody in 2015. And it's a long story, but 
this lady made me understand so many of us don't grasp how a woman's body works and we think what works for one person is going to work for another and we over objectify sex and women's bodies so much that we don't even pay attention to them we don't know how to touch where to touch we think what we saw on the movies in porn magazines is enough that's all there is <laughs> but deeper what is the role of religion in sex the complexity of african sexualities particularly those of women is instrumentalized controlled and regulated by the patriarchal state as sources of power the institutions of culture religion and law structure sexual morality in such a way that it proliferates into states of domination a careful mapping of religions on the continent reveals that 86% of its population subscribe to the imported monotheistic abrahamic religions of islam and christianity all abrahamic faiths believe that god is male described in their different holy scriptures they are all messianic in that they anticipate the coming of a god sent messiah Islam had penetrated the continent by the 12th century while serious attempts to introduce Christianity only happened in the 18th century contrary to popular belief sexuality is not exclusively driven by biology a very significant part of it is socially constructed through legal cultural and religious forces driven by a political economic agenda Sexuality is very much a socio-cultural invention that is closely linked to power and to the processes of subjugation. As Africans, how we do and experience sexuality is heavily influenced by society and culture. How and with whom we have sex, what we desire, what we take pleasure in, how we express that pleasure, why, under what circumstances and with what outcomes are all forms of land behavior communicated through the institutions of culture religion and law it's through these social institutions and social relationships that sexuality is given meaning so who sets the agenda and imparts these sexual truths as the universal norm these are mainly people who at a particular historical point in time exercise power and control discourse politicians media houses cultural leaders religious leaders mainstream educationists multilateral institutions using tools such as the law culture religion media and educational textbooks to disseminate and legitimize these truths thereby enforcing compliance quote and quote truth frameworks about good respectable normal sexuality as well as those for bad immoral and unnatural sexuality are constructed by hegemonic discourses in this era of hiv political christianity and islam have constructed a discourse that suggests that sexuality is the key moral issue on the continent today diverting attention from the real critical moral issues for the majority of africans such as financial security or the plunder misuse disuse and misappropriation of public funds the wanton and fraudulent diversion of public funds by the powerful that prevent the masses from accessing basic human needs such as healthcare clean water education nutrition shelter jobs clothing information and security is the number one moral issue preoccupying the minds of the average african employing religion culture and the law to flag sexuality as the biggest moral issue of our times and dislocating the real issue is a political act and must be recognized as such because you realize it's not from a vacuum that we attach so much secrecy about sex and sexuality and if you looked at how our governments run it's with the same secrecy If you look at how corruption goes, misappropriation of funds go, we thrive in secrecy. In a 2011 article, Leo Igwe comments that secrecy is actually the abode of darkness, ignorance, prejudice, and confusion because whatever is held in secret is like something held in the dark. It can be anything. It can become anything. 
it can become nothing. So I ask again, why are we first afraid of looking at our bodies as African men and secondly, afraid of talking about sex openly? Materi Yawara, born in 1982 in Ivory Coast, is a Malian actress, singer, songwriter, and a multiple Grammy Award nominee, currently living in France. She received two nominations at the 61st Annual Grammy Awards for Best World Music Album for her album Fenfo and Best Dance Recording for Ultimatum, in which she was featured with the English band Disclosure. This song, Kanu, comes from her 2011 album EP under the same title. Secrecy can be a beauty. 
secrecy can also be a weapon of mass destruction. Secrecy can be a weapon of alienation. We just have to take a look at the violent systems and institutions around us. From elections, governments, our marriages, our relationships, our friendships, the work culture. Everything seems to be shrouded in secrecy, violently. I hear people say homosexuality and feminism are Western ideologies. Yet, we don't question how Western our religions are. We don't question what existed here before the white man or the Arab came. Our storytellers were killed. Our museums and houses torched. Our traditional religions demonized. To the white man, civilization only meant following his culture and his faith. It could not exist in any other form. Yet his faith was commercial and politically violent. So what do we really mean when we say something is an African, yet we have so little knowledge of what was African before colonialism and slavery? What informs this sentiment, if not fear? Fear of the unknown, and perhaps fear of ourselves. There was a Facebook post I came across earlier this week. This person put up a screenshot of a man's message saying he'd like to try anal sex but is not sure if there are women who are into it. She was putting it out in confidence for conversation. And what 90% of the men were saying was he must be gay because apparently only gays like it from behind. Evidently, we have a very narrow lens of sex and this is not by accident our socialization our education our religions teach us to view sex from a very negative and narrow point of view if you were brought up to look at everything from a narrow point of view and from a patriarchal point of view definitely as a man, you're going to center everything on yourself. And if things didn't go according to how you saw them, then they wouldn't happen. Or you threatened to be violent to people. The question we need to ask ourselves, why do we want to control sex, yet we do not know our bodies? Why do we want to control government, yet we do not know leadership? Why do we want to control religion, yet we do not know our own gods? Why do we want to control society, yet we do not know ourselves? I wonder what kind of societies we'd have today if people knew the kind of sexual practices ancient Egyptians indulged in. <laughs> in fact, in Niger, every year at the end of the rainy season, the Wodabe tribe an ancient group of nomadic cattle herders in Niger, West Africa, gathers together to celebrate Gerewo, in which the men dress up in elaborate costumes and strut in a kind of beauty pageant. The aim is to impress or steal the wives of other men who choose their favorites to sleep with. White teeth and a straight nose are highly prized features so the men wear lipstick to make their teeth appear bright and paint a white stripe down the center of their nose to make it look sharper. Women wait until their desired man passes by, then tap him on the shoulder. At sunset, the couple disappears into the undergrowth where they'll spend the night together. This woman is allowed to make this man her second husband. How cool is that? But of course, in our patriarchal state. That's not something you can allow, is it? <laughs> we want to control everything. Have you ever asked yourself why when men cheat, they want to be forgiven? But 
a man rarely forgives a woman who cheats. Why? The truth is, we lack healthy male role models to look up to. Those role models and father figures didn't just die. Our systems were disrupted by so many complex things dating back to the 7th century when the Arab slave trade began. This is not just about speaking up. This is about understanding where we are coming from, who we are, our stolen identities, the boys we think we are raising but we are actually killing, the men we think we are becoming but we are actually rotting, the things we think we are building but we are actually destroying. Are we going to live in a state of survival for eternity? The Africa we dream about cannot come forth if we are rigid about our ideals or our perceived ideals because a lot of who the African is today does not even belong to them. That is all I had for us today. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Afro Masculinity Podcast. If you have further comments about what we shared today, feel free to reach out to me via email on Afro Masculinity Podcast at gmail.com. That is Afro Masculinity Podcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at Afromen underscore pod and Afromen pod on Instagram. On Facebook, we are found on Afro Masculinity Podcast. I have been your host, Onyango Otieno. I leave you in the hands of Kenya's Why Read the Love Child, who sings a song titled Usuhuba. Usuhuba Uongo, fake friendship. Don't we all know something about that? Until next time, merci, merci beaucoup to le monde. Mejuana, Bingi Mevitenda Yani Bila Kukosana, Chuki Baina Yenu Bila Nafasi Kutawala, Wengi Wangalida Niku Wakwa Kweni Dada, Dipo Basu Katu Julishana, Machate Tuliane Nana Mawazo Kafanana, Kisha Mauli Etu Yakashinda Yakipatana, Namini Kanza, Kum Shuku Yeye Kweli Kwa Upana, Basi Kweli Tuli Wawongo, Ivani Chafu Kaudo. Yote, sababu nilizilona na mazote Tangu tulipatana siku ya kwanza Simu yu anipikia kila usiku na mchana Nyumani watembelea ukiondoka Yeno la ushawishi likimtoka Niaza kukata wa minifu chukwa shoka Hofu nikatiwa na mibila shaka Katanga nyikiwa Nige litaka, nige fanya Chochote nige waza Lakini nilikaza moyo Ingali nilipatwa ya nibila onyo Mungu tumepewa, tupitatua, tuko pema Shida likitupata, tuwa fahamu, tuko viema Nisipoji chunga, nitajikuta, chini nikijuta Mungu wa minu basi kweli chuni wa uongo Ibani chafuka udongo Mungu betula vikia kwa anachoyo Anachoyo, anachoyo Ya 
Nalo tokea kuwa hasa Najua ni rafiki yako Tiulize yofanya nini juma yako Ni wazi kutazama Utiwe nu unazama Ini kueleze Uhaini na usiende mbele Uwazi kweni chuli wa uongo Imani chafu kwa udongo Ube chura fiki yako wana chono